Welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways we can work together to advance the cause of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Today, we have with us Dr. Sam Rayner. He has published a book called The Church Revitalization Checklist, and he's going to share with us today how you could take the book and use it and how it can be helpful to you as you're working in your church, trying to help your church be as healthy as you possibly can be. And so, uh, Sam, it's so good to have you here with us today, my friend. It is good to be on the show. I really appreciate your time and allowing me to be able to share a little bit about the book. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, my friend. And we should say you're the president of Church Answers. You also are a pastor of a church in Florida, which is not a bad place to be, uh, especially (laughs) in the wintertime. So uh, we know you're busy, Sam, and we thank you for stopping by to be with us today. Well, thank you. What led you to write the Church Revitalization Checklist in the first place? Well, I'm not the first to write about church revitalization. There are others who have gone before me, um, and there's some decent books that are out there, books that inspired me, but there wasn't enough material. There's not a, a big enough conversation around church revitalization. It wasn't, but maybe 10 years ago, uh, we weren't even talking about church revitalization. These were turnaround churches is kind of the language that's been used historically. Um, but there's this movement that's beginning. And I think we're still in the early phases of the movement where people are wanting, particularly church leaders, pastors are wanting to go to these smaller struggling churches and actually do something with them. And that excites me. And I wanted to present something that had not been presented before, which is this idea of a checklist and, you know, seven things that need to be in front of you at all times as you work through a revitalization, a church revitalization. Um, It won't be the, it it won't be the seminal work in church revitalization. Uh, It won't be the last work in church revitalization, but I hope, my hope is that it is a helpful work for pastors. Well, I think you've definitely succeeded there because, well, number one, you talked about getting the subject out there. And so I think you're aware we've been working toward revitalization and we've struggled with that. You know, people are not excited about, oh, yeah, you know, it's hard to get people to give to that or even to focus on it. Um, So you've but you've hit it, I think, at a good time, like you said, where we're on the upswing. Uh, but, but even like the idea of a checklist, you know, so can't the Holy Spirit just move us and don't we only need the Bible and, and prayers and so forth. Yes. So you're kind of getting into, <laughs> we, we need those things and it helps to have a checklist. It, on if, the issues it as does well. help. It does help. But if you have to choose between the Bible and my book, well, that's a very easy choice. And, and, and uh, let's just make it clear. There's a lot of Bible in your book. So yes. Uh, well, and, and I, am, I am somebody who has a very high view of Scripture and a very high view of the sovereignty of God. Um, uh, you know, I, I wanted to write something hopeful. I wanted to write something practical. There's a lot of negativity that's out there about the established church. There's a lot of negativity about traditional churches. There's a lot of negativity about churches that, quote unquote, have seen better days. I wanted, and, and, and a lot of the critiques are true. A lot of them are warranted. I wanted to write something that was hopeful. And yeah. actually pointed yeah. people back to the Bible and points people back to the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe that if God can save any person, he can save any church. Yes. And that's the driving theme of what I'm writing about is, well, do you believe God can save any person? I do. Yes. You know, I, I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then he can save your church. He right. can save any church. And I wanted to write a book about that hope that God gives. So of course, the Bible is first and foremost, and I am as fallible as they come. Uh, but I do hope that I've provided a helpful work for people and can help them through, you know, the process of church revitalization. Yes. And, you know, I think there's a biblical model for this. I think you lay it out in the book. I think if our listeners think about it, the book of Nehemiah, I suspect Nehemiah had a checklist, you know, as he's looking at the walls and he's going through with what he's trying to do. And so it's helpful for us to really get kind of concrete and really think through, you know, what should my priorities be? And, and to kind of look at this almost um, systematically uh, as I'm, I'm trying to help my church become what it can be. Yeah, you know, the idea of a checklist is very simple. Your doctor will, before surgery, will mm-hmm. walk through a checklist. And I actually took inspiration from the book, The Checklist Manifesto. It's, it's not a book with a Christian worldview, but it, it's still a very good book. 
And, you know, your airline pilot will walk through a checklist. Does your doctor know how to perform surgery? Of course. Does your pilot know how to fly a plane? Of course. Um, but the checklist makes sure that as the day-to-day -day grind occurs and as you, you know, we all get tired, we all have bad days, the checklist enables you not to miss something. And that concept, I think, plays well for church revitalization because, as I explained in the book, you know, you need to know, like, okay, what are my priorities? Mm -hmm. How fast pace? How fast can I move? Um, you know, the people, what is their capacity? And these are questions that we need to be asking, even if your church doesn't need to be revitalized. Let's say you're in a very healthy church. I still think these checklist questions help you lead. Mm -hmm. And they're always keeping the, keeping that idea of leadership at the forefront and helping church leaders make sure that they do reasonable and feasible things in their congregations. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not careful, we can get very discouraged. And uh, it can also be a little bit helpful to check some things off from time to time. And we can also, we can get off track as far as the priorities uh, with all the different things that come our way. Yeah. And, you know, there's, uh, there's always the tyranny of the urgent, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the person needs visiting in a hospital, the, the marriage that is in crisis, the family that calls in the middle of the night because, you know, something's wrong with one of their children. You know, there's always the tyranny of the urgent. And, and, and a lot of ministry takes place there. And a lot of ministry should take place there. You've got to walk with people as they live their lives. But what the checklist does is it helps you know, okay, yes, I have to do this thing that is urgent in front of me. But I also need to get back to the work, the longer view of work in, in the life of the church. Because if you're always focused on what is urgent, then, then you're going to miss the strategy to take your church to a better place. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, a, it, it's, it's constant. I say balance um, in life. And you know, I think people know what I mean when I say balance, but I prefer the term harmony. Mm -hmm. um, you know, balance implies that something weighs at the expense of another. Um, I think what we should be trying to achieve is harmony. And there's this harmony in the church of what's urgent and what needs to be done with the long view. And I think the checklist helps you keep that long view in mind. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you, you write a lot about optimism. You write about disappointment and discouragement. I think sometimes having the checklist you can actually see visually, okay, but we are making this progress in facilities or this progress. And, you know, you pick the area, you can actually see it with your eyes and know there is progress here happening. Let me tell you, some of the best things you can do as a leader is go after low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not the first to give that advice, right? But man, do the things that are visible. Do the things that are attainable. Do the things that aren't going to cause a big controversy in your church and get a little momentum going. Um, th those are those little wins can become big wins when it comes to momentum. And I do think optimism is very important in the church. I am an eternal optimist. Every chance that I have to share the gospel with somebody, I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit can work in that person and that person can be saved by the power of Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I just believe that every single chance that I have to share the gospel, I am sharing, believing that that person is going to accept Jesus. So every church that I'm going to walk into that needs to be revitalized, I'm walking into it believing God can do something here. Now, mm. that is God's work. That is God's choice. I don't regenerate a soul, and I certainly myself can't turn a church around. That's the work of the Spirit. But as a leader, I'm going to walk into it believing that God can. Mm. And that's the optimism that I talk about in the book. There is so much negativity that's out there. And we live in a very polarized society. Some people might say, that their polar view is justified. Fair enough. Okay. We're still polarized. And there's a lot of um, antagonism in churches today. Well, I want to, I, I understand why I get it. And some of it is warranted, but I wanted to, to put a hopeful message out there. And I just, the whole point of the book is God can, and God will, if you will follow what he wants you to do. Yeah. And so everything really you see in here, like that a checklist is based on, that's what the scripture says we are to be doing. And really what you're saying is if we're about doing those things, then we're going to see our churches truly revitalized. 
I do. Um, you know, this is uh, my my book's not going to solve all your problems. I would be a fool to say that. Um, but I do believe that if you keep some very key principles at the forefront, that God's going to honor your work. Now, does it mean that your church is going to triple in a year, triple in size? I don't know. Maybe God does that. That would be unusual, though. Mm. Um, but I have a checklist. Some of your viewers may be listening and not viewing. Um, but I have a checklist behind me. Uh, if, for those of you who can see it, it's got first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. These are the goals that I want to accomplish in my church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm going to put these on my board. And I'm going to every time I walk into my office, I'm going to see them. And they're going to stay there until they're done. And that's my reminder that, hey, these are the tasks that are important. These are the tasks that have been prayed for. These are the tasks that um, we've worked with the staff and committees on. And this is the direction the church needs to head per the church. So why wouldn't we keep these things at the forefront? And they're going to be a little different for every church, but I have written the book with this idea of seven kind of principles that um, will work in most churches. I'll just say that. Yeah, that's good. Well, you kind of backed into that a little bit earlier. You mentioned about trying to share your faith with whoever you see and hoping that they come to the gospel. And I think toward the end of the book, you talk a bit about that, like that is something that we're not seeing, you know, it's oh, not sharing yes. faith today. And some, some folks say as many as 90% have never really shared the gospel with others. And so I do think you give a good prescription for that uh, towards the end there. What do you do if your church is not, you know, sharing their faith? Let's get into that it, a little bit and kind of unpack it, that. It is a major problem in the North American church. There is a complete lack of evangelistic work across the board. Now, I'm sure you could point to some of the churches in your world that are doing really well in this area. Um, but the vast majority are not, and it is a sad state of evangelism that is causing a lot of declines in, in the church in general, and I think we need to get back to doing more evangelism in the church. I, we do a lot of consultations at Church Answers. We, we're in a lot of churches of various tribes, and this is the number one recommendation we make. It's almost like we could create a template of of a consultation and the top two or three things are just basically the same in every church. Number one is you're not thinking outwardly. Any church that is not thinking outwardly will naturally revert inwardly. And the most healthy churches inwardly are the ones that are most focused outwardly. And, you, you know, inviting somebody to church isn't evangelism, but goodness, let's just start there. Yeah. Like let's just, let's, when was the last time you invited your neighbor to church and told him, Hey, it may not be your jam, but all right, come with me and I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. Just do it for me. Do it. And I mean, goodness, we got to get more bold in our faith. Um, at my church, we've started going door to door again. I know the pandemic caused a lot of people to be a little, you know, iffy on that, but we're, we're just reaching out. Our whole perspective is we don't know our neighbors as well as we should. So let's just go get to know our neighbors. Let's go knock on their door and just get to know them. Let's bring them a gift. Let's say, hey, we're the church in the neighborhood. We're here for you. If you've got any prayer requests, let us know. Gospel conversations open up from that. So it's time that we get back to the basics mm -hmm. of what churches should be doing, which is get out there, share your faith, and disciple those who are needing to be assimilated into the body of Christ. And I think we've lost sight of that, and it's unfortunate. Excellent. And you, you mentioned, hey, if it's not happening in your church, model it as a leader. If you're Exactly. Start yeah. with the people you got. So you may say, well, you know what? I only got two or three people that are willing to do evangelism with me. That's awesome. You have two or three people that are willing to do evangelism with you. Well, I got a church of two or 300, only two or three, only 1% of the church is willing to do evangelism. You know what? Two or three people can win a lot of souls for Jesus yeah. if you just get out there and do it. And it's contagious. Once your church sees it happening, more people will want to be involved. Will you have the entire church involved in some sort of evangelistic program? Probably not. I mean, if you're able to do that, write a book, please. Yeah. I will buy it because I want to know how to do that. Um, but let's say you can get 1% or 5% doing evangelism. Man, what if, what if one or one to 5% of your church could win a soul to Jesus every six months? Mm -hmm. You're in growth mode again as a church. So I think we, I think we overthink it. 
with you know this massive program that we need hundreds involved in, man, if that happens, that's awesome. But really, this can begin with you, with your team, with your staff. I look at churches that have a staff of five or seven or 10. If the staff will just be obedient to the Great Commission, if the staff will just be obedient to the Acts 1-8 imperative, that church will grow. Yeah. It doesn't take even the laity. And I understand, I, you know, the, the people of the church should be doing the work of the church, and pastors are there to equip the saints. I get that. But just take your staff and start there. If you got nobody, start with the staff. Start with you. Start with one or two people. Start with a couple of deacons. It can be done, and it will inspire the church. Absolutely. Great. Well, you wrote this book. We've got it. How do you suggest folks use it, uh, like can using it in groups and so forth? If I'm a pastor listening and I'm like, you know, this is great. I'm trying to put some of this into practice. You think of some ideas that pastors could come together uh, to do that? Yeah, I would start with your leadership team. I would start there um, with your core leaders, whatever structure the church you have, mm -hmm. go through the book. And then if it's something that you want to do more broadly, I would, with more people, I would say, pick a chapter, pick one of the seven pieces of the checklist and focus on that. Um, don't bite off more than you can chew. There's something to be said. And this is one of the chapters is how to do a six month strategic emphasis that involves more people. And there's a whole chapter on the reason that churches don't often achieve the vision of of, of the church is simply because we don't put a strategy in place to, to, to get there. So vision is the goal. That's the, that's that point just beyond the horizon. Strategy is the pathway to get there. Your tactics are the steps along the pathway. Churches tend to be very good at vision. Hey, this is what we want to be. Churches tend to be very good at tactics. This is what we do every week. Not enough build that pathway so that the tactics can take them to the vision. I've got a whole chapter on that. It'd be th that's it's called an MHAG, a middle holy audacious goal. Mm -hmm. um, you can read about more about it in the book if that captures your attention. Yes, it's a spinoff of uh, Jim Collins and the BHAG. If you've ever read Good to Great, um, but we've applied it to the church. We've made it a more biblical model for the church, mm -hmm. um, and it's a way to just think about things in terms of every six months we're going to do something, and it, that that strategy is going to take you someplace. Um, take your people through that take them through an impact. That's just one chapter in the book and one example of how to use it so that you can start getting your church moving. That's great. Hey, thank you, Sam. Appreciate you joining us today, my friend. Thank we, you. Hey, we, it's uh, been a very enjoyable time. And thank you for all our listeners. Thank you for joining us. We want to encourage you to take this podcast, like it, share it, pass it on to someone that would benefit. And remember, when we truly do work together, we are better together.